Hey, welcome back to the Crowdfunding Demystified Podcast. This is Salvador Brigman hailing in from Miami, Florida. It is a beautiful day here in Miami. If you've never been, it is a wonderful place. So many cool new things that are happening here as well in the business realm, in tech, finance, etc. And um, one of the things I want to just say before we get into today's podcast is I commend you so much for showing up for yourself today. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that when you're doing something new, it is so hard sometimes to actually buckle down and to absorb some quality education and training on that subject. And I I think I'm the most guilty of someone who just doesn't like doing that. Uh, you know, when I was going, you know, going to school in whether it's high school or college, I just found my classes so freaking boring, man. I wasn't really interested in learning about geometry and stuff that I would never use or trigonometry when I knew I wasn't gonna become an engineer. But I just found this stuff so boring, it wasn't very applicable to me. But once I started to actually learn about the things that I care about, I realized just how much I love learning. And I knew that when I started this podcast that I wanted it to be a similar experience for you. I didn't want this to be just another boring podcast where people are droning on and on. And um, also something where it's like you're literally listening to a dude lecture at the front of a class. I find that to be so incredibly boring and such a waste of time. I really want to cut straight to the heart, which is exactly why I try to get to the crux of crowdfunding. Ah, you like how I did that? Because I my website obviously is crowdcrux.com. I try to demystify this for you. I try to pull it apart. I try to attack it from many different angles, from many different types of creators around the world, people from many different experience levels. Sometimes it's their first campaign. Sometimes it's their 20th campaign. Um, getting into some of the things you should know about when it comes to marketing your project, getting traffic, getting funding. For those creative tapes out there, really, what do you do to get an idea in your head into the real world? So go out there and go and check out some of my other episodes on this particular podcast. If you want to learn the tactics, the strategy, the nuts and bolts, the nuggets of gold, when it comes to getting a campaign funded and really driving traffic to it. In addition, uh, if you want to learn more about creativity, I think that today's episode is going to be great for people out there that are struggling to structure their creative work. Now, that could be someone who's creative in many different ways, whether you're a product designer, if you're someone who's trying to create a new artwork or an album, you're trying to create something when it comes to a novel, um, you're trying to publish something online like that, you're trying to even get into YouTube or podcasting or whatever kind of creativity that you're involved with. There's so many you know, different items under the sun there. Whatever kind of creativity you're involved with, I'm promising you the number one thing that's holding you back is your ability to organize your work. And this is something that for myself as a creative person was one of the most difficult things to swallow because I didn't realize that organization just played such a huge role in effectiveness and being able to take action, to take ideas and to bring them into the real world and to really just execute, right? To get something out there that had not existed before. So if you feel like you struggle with that, I think you're really going to like today's podcast episode because I brought on an expert when it comes to organizational productivity, when it comes to structuring your work, and also some of the easy ways in which you can be more effective in getting a project out there to the world. You're going to hear on today's episode from this individual who is also an author, also a course creator, and really just some of the unique ways in which they've been able to design their life to make turning things that are ideas into real world products or into real world things so much easier and almost down. They boiled it down to a system. So I think you're going to enjoy a lot about that in today's podcast. Without further ado, let's get straight into it. Hey guys, welcome back to the Crowdfunding Demystified Podcast. Today we're speaking about creativity, and specifically I brought on a guest who can help you turn your ideas into physical products, and who can really help when it comes to organization of just getting your creativity out there, how to turn your passion into profit, and this is Romina, who is a creative entrepreneur. Romina, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Definitely. Um, so I've been looking forward to this conversation and just so that the guests kind of know, um, maybe you can just kind of tell them a little bit about what you do and how you help creative types and we can just kind of start there. Sure. I guess the best place to start would be to talk about my own creative journey because I feel like a lot of the things that I talk about really stems from my experience and my past and the struggles that I've had to go through as a creative, being able to figure out how to handle my everyday life with my brain was definitely something that it took a lot of time. And I had to create various systems for myself 
to make it all work and make it make sense and actually be productive with my creativity. And so I try to bring that to creatives. The number one question that, that I always get is, how do you do all these things? I get that so often and it really comes down to creating these systems and having a process um, for myself yeah. and then sharing that with others. So in terms of creativity, are you a graphic designer? Are you a videographer? What kind of creative outlets do you have? I have so many. It's so hard to just uh, encompass it into just one. But I feel like the most, the one that I spent the most time in, So I, so I was a I did work in the film industry for over a decade. So that it that entailed being in front of the camera and behind the camera as well. Uh, so I've been an actor, producer, director, and editor. That's insane. Yeah. <laughs> um, I love movies. I hate, that's like, I think that's my, my biggest passion is just movies. I love watching movies and I love making movies. And I also write as well. I started writing when I was about 10 years old with uh, poetry and short stories. And so I feel like I kind of express myself in a lot of different ways when yeah, I say creative. Sure. It's a lot easier to just say creative than one Yeah, thing. I mean, that's, there's definitely a lot, of, a lot of things under the sun. So it sounds like your kind of creativity brings you into different mediums. So for you, what do you feel like are some of those struggles that you've had? Is it being able to focus? Is it being able to like go from A to Z with the project? What are some of the struggles you've had? Some of the struggles that I've had have been focused definitely is number one. I was diagnosed with ADD at a very early age. And because of that, I was very aware of the way that my brain worked or, you know, the way that they tell me that my brain worked. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I think that it, I think that kind of having an idea of how it worked helped me to figure out what were the pain stakes, what were the things that were really making life difficult for me and making it really difficult for me to get my work done. In part, it's it's not just focus like sitting down and doing the work, but also focus in, for example, being told to niche down is... I mean, that is so hard to hear, especially very early on in my creative career, going out to Hollywood, for example, and trying to pursue an acting career when you're 18 years old, and then having people tell you that you have to go out for a specific type of role or um, this is your personality. You. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I started to develop uh as as an individual alongside that which is very difficult to do um because being an actor you're pretending to be other people and then at the same time i'm still like my brain is still developing i was like yeah, 18 yeah, years old yeah, right sure. and so i was still trying to figure out who i was as as an individual like irl in real life i didn't i didn't really know who i was yet you yeah, know yeah, yeah. i had an idea of who i wanted to be i'm but still figuring that out yeah no exactly and yeah. it's it's a lifelong journey and you you can only like improve uh, improve with like little micro steps but mm -hmm. but having people kind of like put me in a box it was very difficult early on but going into it and and starting to organize and create like a process for myself and a strategy for myself of, okay, how am I going to actually sell my work and sell what I do and, and get people interested in what I do? Um, because ultimately if people aren't paying attention, then I'm not making the impact that I want to make. Mm -hmm. And so within that, being able to learn how to focus and, um, and figure out what, what, those so are just to kind of like, Mm -hmm. dial into that more like what led to that aha moment were you having a moment in time where you're like gosh i really need to figure this out <laughs> yeah i had a lot of those yeah i definitely had a lot of those and i think that acting helped me immensely to get to that point i also became a producer very early on so i think that my first production i was producing a feature film when i was 20 years old mm -hmm. And that was a huge undertaking because I still had no idea what I was doing professionally. Yeah. 
And here I was in charge of about 40 crew members yeah. and very expensive. Big budget. Yes. Equipment. A lot of expectations. Locations. Yeah. A lot of opinions. Mm. Uh, so that was a huge learning experience for me. Mm. And I think that producing helps me to kind of get to that point. You of, have to be organized. Yeah. Yeah. Incredibly organized and being able to deal with so many different types of people also helps to you kind of or at least i learned how to compartmentalize people's opinions mm. and and kind of needs and wants and expectations yeah yeah and yeah. and and have all these little buckets in order to organize everything to to make it work and make it fit for the overall picture mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so let's kind of just focus on one specific like aspect of your creativity so like for example with video right mm. You got a lot of industry experience, it sounds like, and then you sort of started to parlay this into a personal brand, it sounds like. When did you really make that decision to put yourself out there like that? So I first joined YouTube in 2006. Back then, it wasn't really like a place where people were talking about brands or doing sponsorships or anything like that. It was just kind of like a random place to post videos. And I was already making videos on my own and I had been for years and like, I mean, I took little cameras to school and I would record my day essentially, but there was nowhere to post them. They were just like for me. Yeah. And so hopping onto YouTube was really where my journey began in terms of figuring out who I was and who I wanted to be. And then putting that into a personal brand. So YouTube was definitely like the catalyst for me in terms of defining my personal brand. It wasn't until, cause I stopped, I stopped uploading, uploading to YouTube for a while. And then I came back in like 2012, 2013. And in that time was when I really, because of all the experience that I had already gained yeah. from doing production and doing marketing. At that time, I had um, developed a web design uh, agency and I was starting to do like social media management for people and brands. And so having all of that experience like put together, then I returned to the internet as myself. Mm. And I was like, okay, I think I'm ready now because I, I know now that I need to formulate like this package for myself. And that's about the time where the personal brand really began, which was Red Romina. And it's just red is my favorite color. So <laughs> I like red too. Um, so, you know, when it comes to that, did you really like sit down at a table and you made a conscious decision that you were going to kind of package this? Like you were going to figure out brand guidelines. You're going to figure out what your story is. Did you like make that kind of conscious decision? In part, I would say maybe like 30%. <laughs> I'm very much a... Oh, there's a pool. Let me jump in. Yeah, kind yeah, of person. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so it wasn't as planned out as people might think. I mean, because you have a lot of yeah. subscribers now. Yeah. So when I did start out, I knew that I wanted to focus on travel content. And so I reverse engineered other people on YouTube who were doing the same thing that I wanted to be doing. I figured out like where they started. I kind of saw like the format, how they were uh, doing their videos and how they had uh, their kind of their brand set up. Yeah, and I used yeah. that as my guideline, right? And when did you or how did you begin to think about like monetization? Or is that not even a thought in your mind? Like you're just more interested in like sharing your creative work or did you have like a monetization strategy? So I did. So or, originally when I was thinking about this, um, I wanted to travel for free. <laughs> and that cool was idea. that was the monetization uh, aspect yeah. of it, right? Uh, was I, I wanted to be able to travel and not have it be an added expense in my life. I wanted to be able to share the world with people. I've been traveling since I was like three years old. My mom loves to travel. And so as soon as I was born, my mom was just like, she's going everywhere with us. And so I was on planes very early on in my life. And so I think that having that love for travel and that experience and realizing that other people hadn't had that same experience and that same life made me want to share that with other people because it was something that was so important to me. 
and I wanted other people to experience it as well. Why is that so important to you? Um, I think it was, I think it's important because it made me think about the way that other people lived their life in other parts of the world. And it was something that I didn't really think about because again, this is how I grew up. Like this was just like going down the street and it didn't feel any different for me while I was doing it because I was so young. But as I got older, I realized that I had this knowledge of the world that a lot of people my age didn't have. That gave me some perspective and it gave me leverage that other people just didn't have. Yeah, for sure. And I think you're sharing that experience, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is super cool. So, you know, in just kind of talking with you, like informally, I think the one thing that really stood out to me is that you're this incredibly like creative person, right? And it's almost like so inbred into you from just a young age, like, you know, whether it's taking your camera to school or wanting to capture moments and like share things, being able to do like a production crew at a very early age and being charged like all these people, like you're really like well steeped in like creativity. But then you're also super good. I've never seen someone who's so organized <laughs> in my entire life. Yeah. When did that process really begin when you start to like systematize this? And can you just talk a little bit about like this system that you've made? Oh, absolutely. I think it started at the, I think it started in the womb, really. <laughs> <laughs> I, so because of having trouble focusing and being, having kind of this chaotic life and, and wanting to do so many things at the same time, there was no option for me but to become hyper organized and being able to be on top of all of my little things because if not, I would be living a very chaotic life. Mm. And I'm not sure that I would be where I am today if I hadn't started organizing years ago. And part of that is because I, I am very fortunate because my mother is very organized. That's and, a plus. Um, but I am a lot more organized than she is. Like it's, it, I've upgraded <laughs> and she, uh, she definitely instilled in me a, uh, this sense of wanting to be organized and have my things, having, having a home for everything. Right. Yeah. And I think, I think that's, that's where that, that started. If you're worried about the fulfillment and shipping part of your Kickstarter campaign when it comes to getting out all of those perks and rewards to your backers, rest assured I've put together a complete Kickstarter fulfillment and shipping checklist for you and it's free. This is sponsored by the folks at FulfillRight and they thought that you should have this checklist as part of your arsenal going into a crowdfunding campaign. If you want to get instant access to this checklist and it's free, you can go to fulfillright.com slash checklist. Again, that is F-U-L-F-I-L-L-R-I-T-E dot com slash checklist. Fulfillright.com slash checklist. Just go to that link and you can download it immediately. So someone comes to you and they're like, Romina, I got so much going on. I got book project. I got doing this, doing that. What's your first bit of advice to them when it comes to really trying to like create a better either productivity system or like being more organized about what they're doing? There's a lot of different ways that someone can organize their life. And it's really a matter of finding what's right for the individual. Because for myself, I've gone through a lot of different systems to get to one that I use now and that I have used for years. And I feel like sometimes I think the first step is to forgive yourself because it's very easy to look at other people online and see their morning routines yeah. or see their beautiful planners and their bullet journals. And you think, wow, oh my gosh, I, what am I doing with my life? Mm -hmm. Like this person, like, wait, how do they have time? Like you see people and they meditate for an hour in the morning and then they make yeah, like their yeah, matcha yeah. latte and then they're like painting their name. And it's like all this stuff. And you're like, when do you have time to like work and eat and sleep and like just hang out? Like, when are you doing all these things, right? Because they're like, their morning routines are like six hours long, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that relieving yourself of that kind of pressure 
you don't know like where these people are, right? You don't know where they are in their lives, like what else they're struggling with. Don't compare with. yourself. Don't compare yourself to other people and forgive yourself because that's really the starting point of, and it's okay to decide to, to pick a system and then change it three months down the line. Because if it's not working for you or if you find that your life your lifestyle has changed, there's new things that are popping up on your schedule, then it's time to change, time to adapt. So when you say the word system, are you mm -hmm. meaning like a planner? Are you meaning like a software tool? What do you mean when you say system? All of the above. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, system is the process in which something gets done. Okay. So whether that is through a planner or software or just like keeping it in your head, which I don't recommend, but that's, it's, it's whatever is your system. You know, you, you come home, you have a place to like throw your keys. You have a place to like throw your jacket, put your shoes. That's a system, right? So it's the same way where it's like you, you create these systems of where these things need to go and you revisit them daily or weekly. So I think most people would agree a system makes sense, yeah. right? But I think what a lot of people, what happens is that they try one out and it just kind of works for like a week and then they just kind of give up on it, right? Or yeah. like it doesn't stick with them. Why do you think that is? Like how do you actually continue using it and continue having this being part of your life and like really affect the outcome of the project? Like you said, um, the productivity, right, when it comes to that. I would say to give any system at least two weeks <laughs> <laughs> before you decide to quit. I think that's just what it is. You just have to do it. In terms of, again, this kind of goes back to what I said before, which is forgiving yourself and allowing yourself to accept the fact that maybe this system doesn't work for you. Okay. You have okay. to move on to another system. Just to be a little bit more, like get more into this. So from what it sounds like with the one at least you've developed, mm. it sounds like there's sort of a time component. There's a file component. And then like how you're actually spending your time, right? Yep. Would you say that's accurate or am I leaving out any pieces there? No, I'd say that's pretty accurate. I do a lot of, so to kind of break down, I guess, I mean, there's a lot of like different systems that fall into like a huge system of how I run everything. But in terms of how I run my day to day, I use the Kanban board system. The Kanban board system is just having columns of the different processes for each task. So it's like to do, doing, done, right? So, so just to make it more clear, let's, mm -hmm. let's, let's imagine we're writing a new book. Yep. So how would you like um, take that and put that into that example? Like you're writing a new book, what might be some of those examples? Yeah. I think that if, I think that in writing a new book, I would say that, um, using that same system works for me. Um, having the Kanban board works. And I think that having like in terms of so developing, do, you mean? Like, yeah. So like to do items would be like, maybe I need to outline it. You're mm -hmm. saying, and then like doing is like, I'm right now picking a cover and done is like, this thing is being completed. Is that kind of yeah. how? Yeah. It's, it's like, so some of the things that need to get done is like outlining, um, doing research, like if you need to do some kind of research, like character breakdowns, whatever it is, to, depending on the type of book, like hiring a graphic designer for the cover, right? Getting a PR agent or something, right? Like these are all like to do items. And then as you're doing them, you just like move them over to the doing column. And then once they're done, then you move them over to the done column. But I think like what's most important is to pinpoint on the idea of breaking down tasks into even smaller like micro tasks so like outline my book is like a really big undertaking that's not something that just happens in a day yeah right yeah, i mean yeah. depending on the book right but if we're talking about like if we're talking specifically about like a nonfiction book right and it's going to be like 200 to 300 pages right that's not you don't just put I it's need to outline my book, right? Yeah, you don't yeah, put that on long. your to-do list because yeah. that's going to be there for like a year, right? Yeah. So instead, you can break that down to outlining the different chapters that you want to have. Got so it. for example, my book has 10 chapters, right? You just decide what the chapters are and then you start breaking that down into even smaller tasks of outline chapter one, outline chapter two, et cetera, right? And just keep breaking that down so that you have like these little tasks that you can do every day that will help you 
towards accomplishing a much bigger goal down the line. Got it. Got it. Uh, so I think that's a, that's a huge overwhelming problem because like, I want to start a YouTube channel to say, and then it's like, okay, I got to do this, 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 and this. And then you're trying to keep track of those things you have to do. And you're trying to do them at the same time. So what you're saying is like, list out all the things that you got to do, break them down more specifically, and then start actually attacking those tasks. Yeah. Do you have an idea of how many should be in the, I'm currently doing it? Is it just like one you're focusing on or you can do multiple? So how I have my day-to-day -day set up is I try to not have more than three to five tasks a day. And, Easy life. <laughs> and that is that really depends on what the actual task is, yeah. right? Yeah. Because, I mean, some tasks are just like super quick. And so that means I could go, you know, have like five tasks instead of three. But if these tasks are a lot more um, time consuming or energy consuming, then I'm going to want to have, I want to get closer to three. But I feel like three is like a good average number that's pretty safe or has been pretty safe for me um, in terms of getting those things done. Because also part of it, too, is being able to feel rewarded, being able to feel like you're actually mm, accomplishing yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. So if you keep putting too many things on your everyday calendar, then you're going to feel overwhelmed and you're going to feel under accomplished because you're not you're not completing. You're not crossing these things off. Okay. So it's kind of almost like future, present, past, mm -hmm. right? So past is like what I completed. Present is like what I'm doing right now. And the to-do items are like the future basically. Yeah. So in the present, like let's just say you have those three tasks that you're doing. Are you just sitting at a desk? Like your eyes are just like, you know, super focused for like five hours at a time. Or like, how do you break up your time throughout that day? I try to take breaks. I think it depends <laughs> on, again, on the task, right? Because yeah. like some tasks are, are easier than others and, and it's not, the energy is, is not as draining. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I think that uh, it is important to, to have those moments of being able to, so when I, when I complete a task, I try to move it over to my done side whenever I'm done with it. Because then like throughout the day, I'm going through and I'm crossing things off and moving things out of that to-do list. And so I'm I'm getting that reward immediately. Yeah. Um, it's like you're eating a whale like one bite at a time. Like, yeah. Yeah, very slowly. Pretty much, yeah. Very cool. Um, so first of all, I could see that working a lot. Like for any big project, you can kind of fit it into that model, mm -hmm. right? I guess my question is, where does the file structure come in? Is that like as you're producing work, then you're organizing it according to some kind of a file structure or... Yeah, this this kind of goes back to deciding where everything lives and setting up a system to begin with, because as uh, once you have a system that's in place, it's a lot easier to maintain it. Mm -hmm. That first time where you have to set up the system, that's the hardest because you have to really figure out where everything goes and if you actually need to keep certain things. Yeah. And so I have um I have my documents all set up in folders and then within those there's more folders and everything is organized has like an higher hierarchy for it. And I think that knowing where everything is, like I don't have to think twice about like where to put something. Yeah. And I also don't have to think twice about where something is. Mm -hmm. Got it, got it. Kind of like mixes so you don't have to think as hard. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it's is, it's a little bit training. like working on autopilot. Very cool. Very cool. Um, so just out of curiosity, I mean, to, to, you know, you have a lot of different like disciplines that you've mastered and you have this whole process. Like what is the most rewarding part of this for you? Is it really seeing the outcome or is it being able to like have complete control over the process? Like what's most rewarding to you? I think the process is the most rewarding it's okay. just like the process itself. It's just cool. It's like, it's kind of like when you clean something, like physically clean something. Oh, I hate cleaning. It's just, like, <laughs> well, yeah, but, but maybe you don't like the process itself, but you do like how oh, it yeah, ends yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. But, but see, I like getting to that process because I'm seeing progress. I'm seeing progress. Ah, yeah. I see. And so that's exciting to me. I think also the prospect of being able to impact 
other people mm. and have a positive influence on other people and, and motivate other people to do the same also encourages me and yeah. makes me want to keep doing what I do. Mm -hmm. What's been the most rewarding or memorable thing that someone has said after either trying out your course or like listening to you give advice about this? Like what's something that's memorable that someone has said to you? That's tough. I can't just pick one because it's, it's always nice to hear when people leave me comments like on my videos and they tell me that they did a certain thing yeah. my way. And, and, and it's, 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 it is a weird kind of concept to like wrap my head around. Cause it's like, this is just how I do things and how I've learned to manage my own things. I don't expect other people to apply it to their lives, but it is always fascinating to hear when, when somebody has done something the way that I do it just because it worked for them. Yeah, for sure. So, um, I mean, there's, there's obviously tons of different like comments that you have, um, here's like one example. Um, someone you said that after talking with you that it was so cool to have like all this information in like one tidy presentation, being able to organize photos or even passwords, so many different cool projects that you can use for this. Um, definitely essentials that you need to make your life more efficient. Um, great tips to organize yourself. So people said some very, some really good things about this for sure. Yeah. Which is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah it is. <laughs> I mean, it's nice. Um, so, I mean, we're coming close to the end of the interview. I guess I have just one or two more questions on, like, on you and your, your creative process. So you do enjoy the process. Do you find that certain work comes more easily to you than other kinds? And do you find that procrastination is something that ever enters your mind? Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, to answer the last question, because that's easy. <laughs> yeah, procrastination does enter my mind. Um, I some I, I feel that a lot of the times it's it's when I've taken on too much. And it's also kind of a self-doubting kind of thing of like, well, you know, if I don't actually do the thing, then I don't have to prove that I can do the thing. Can you give an example? Yes, I can actually give an example. So I, I'm, I'm working on my book now. And the last chapter that I was working on, I kept putting it off. And like I kept coming to it. I would write like two sentences and I would be like, oh, good for me. Like I did two sentences, you know, like everybody's like, at least, you know, if you write like at least a word, you're moving towards your goal. Right. Um, but it didn't feel good because I knew in my back of my mind that I was putting it off for whatever reason. And and part of it is 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 because it was the the threshold. It was my goal of like, OK, after I finish this chapter I'm going to start moving on to the next process of what I have on my list of things for this book. And so there was that kind of like, I put the brakes on myself where I was like, wait a second, don't go to the next level yet. You're, you're, you're not ready yet. And, and, and it's that kind of thing that propels the procrastination for me. Yeah. Um, because in terms of like... Do you think it's based in fear or what do you think it's based in? I think it is. I think part of it is is definitely um, is is fear in succeeding. Mm. It's um, it's fear in, okay, I've done this thing. I've accomplished this thing, but now I'm on to this next chapter. I'm, I'm into this next level. What is that going to be like? Ups the ante. Right? Yeah. 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 And it, so it changes things and it's like, okay, now I have to get ready to like adapt again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because I've already gotten comfortable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, I think within my own, my own work is definitely a lot of task switching. Mm -hmm. I'm like, Oh, I have to get in this other mindset. Right. Yeah. So like if you're doing like creative stuff and you go into sales or you're going from sales to marketing, it's like, Oh, I gotta, I gotta change my mind, get into a different mindset. And then I always end up procrastinating obviously yeah. on, on those kinds <laughs> of things. Um, very cool. Where can people go to learn a little bit more about you and some of the stuff that you have put out here you have different courses you have different bundles where can people go to learn more about this uh, probably my website is the best one which is redromina.com and i'm also on twitter i'm at redromina on twitter 
And I don't know if you can talk about this, but I know you're working on a book. Mm. What is what is that about exactly? So it's a nonfiction book to help people who have really big dreams find the courage in order to do whatever it is that they want to do. That's cool. That's cool. That sounds exciting. Any ideas when that might come out? I am just getting started. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Awesome. So I'll be sure to link it up. So um, my final question for you, and you know, you can kind of speak more directly to the listeners. You have, I think, a lot of people who come from different creative backgrounds, and they might be at different points in their life. I think we can end on this note. Maybe you can end with either a final quote that you like. It could be a word of encouragement. It could be a final tip. It could be something that you wish that you knew when you were kind of getting started on the journey. Any of those, we can end on that note. <laughs> I'm trying to go through like the whole <laughs> encyclopedia in my <laughs> head of like cool things I can say. <laughs> no pressure. Any, anything that's honest. Yeah. Mm, I think my number one takeaway from all of my experiences has always been to adapt and keep going. And I think that's the best overall advice that I can give people without knowing specifically what they're going through. I think that's the best advice for any problem that you can have is, is adapt and keep going. Well said. Thanks for coming on. Be sure to link up uh, your site and these other uh, your course in the description. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Crowdfunding Demystified Podcast. Again, my name is Salvador Brigman. Hope you took some value away out of today's podcast episode. Uh, this is a bit of a different style of episode. Typically, we bring on individuals who have successfully raised money when it comes to a crowdfunding campaign. But I want to bring on this different style, this different flavor to give you just an assortment of different ways in which you can turn your ideas into reality. You know, how do you turn those things you're dreaming of, you're thinking of into real world products? Um, how do you take that creativity, really execute on that and have an end product once you've gone through that entire process? So if you did enjoy today's alternative style of podcast, go to crowdcrux.com, my website, C-R-O-W-D-C-R-U-X.com. Uh, go there, go to the contact form, shoot me an email and be like, Sal, that episode you did was awesome, man. I loved it. It was killer. You got to do more like that occasionally. Um, that means so much to me. And I do get, man, I'm telling you, dude, I get my inbox flooded. We got so many inquiries all the time, but I will take some time. If you maybe put something like this episode or just something in the subject line to really catch my attention, I promise I will read your email. Um, just put something in the subject line that will catch my, my name or something like that, right? Get my attention there. Uh, I have to, I have to probably get a cup of coffee late at night and, and just be willing to go through all of the different emails that I've been getting recently. Uh, but I do love you guys. Um, thank you so much for listening to this podcast. Please leave a positive rating and review as well if you're listening on, on iTunes. And in addition, if you really want to do lock me down, secure my time, you want to go into an intensive coaching call with me when it comes to your product, when it comes to your creativity, really how to take action, how to go through a step-by-step -step process so that you can move faster towards your goals, right? When it comes to turning something that's creative and an idea into a real world physical product or to execute on this doing a crowdfunding campaign to monetize your passion in many different ways. If you want to talk more about that and really get into your unique case, go to the link I'm about to mention and book a one-on-one -on -one coaching call with me. That link is crowdcrux.com slash coaching, crowdcrux.com slash coaching. That link is crowdcrux.com slash coaching. Go there, fill out a little bit of information about you, what are your goals, tell me a little bit about um, your backstory, what you've been working on. We'd love to hear a little bit about that and we can get that call scheduled ASAP. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. Hope that you enjoyed it. Take some action this week towards your goals that make me so happy and I will see you next time.